Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very, very special uh, thinking um, with John Ronson, uh, a man who needs little introduction. I will do my best uh, not to say nothing, but I can't say everything about him, otherwise we'll be here uh, all evening because he's done so much in so many fields and is such an interesting person. Um, my name is Matt Dancona. I'm an editor here at Tortoise. This is a very, uh, there are two things to say about this occasion. First of all, it's we think the biggest thinking, we know it's the biggest thinking we've ever held, more than 900 people uh, connecting tonight. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's also a thinking that's, that's um, substituting for an event we were going to have at the Kite Festival in June, um, which along with the Olympics, uh, big shops, romance, and all sorts of other things has been postponed. It will happen in physical form at some point, but for the moment, uh, we have this very wonderful opportunity to talk to John about um, his work, his ideas, what he thinks about coronavirus, and many other things. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we get into the, the, the real stuff. Um, those of you who've been to a thinking before or taken part in a digital thinking will be familiar with the concept. It's a, it's a digital um, online uh, open source version of a newsroom. So the idea really is that uh, we get less to questions than to contributions. Um, we want you to tell us what you think, uh, come in with thoughts for John. He can uh, respond and uh, dispense with them and give you uh, his own insights into the points you're interested in making. Now you'll see um, that you have a the opportunity to raise your hand um, and there's a button there which says on the participants uh, button if you click on that and that will enable you to uh, see a box with a ra with raise hand and that means that you can draw your uh, points to the attention of people who are moderating this uh, my very wonderful colleagues Liv and Liz and Sam Hockley and then we can include as many of you as possible which is of course the objective um, well, there's also a chat stream and we'll be monitoring that so that helps us know if you have a point you want to make. Again, go, in, go into the chat stream, let us know what you're thinking, and we'll bring you in to talk to John and to uh, say anything that's really on your mind. And John very kindly said that although obviously we'll, we'll uh, address the, the current pandemic and how it relates to his work, he's very happy to talk about all the many things he's done, which is a considerable panorama. So John, welcome. Um, you're, you're in upstate New York, um, and you've been there a while, haven't you, actually, I think? Yeah, well, I've been in lockdown um, about two weeks longer than anybody else was, because, um, because as soon as the coronavirus thing started happening, it's, it's interesting, I mean, I've, I've spoken about this a little bit before, but what I noticed was, you know, as, as somebody who spends his life catastrophizing, and uh, as soon as a real crisis happens, not only did the future just become very obvious to me, like, okay, you know, this is going to happen. We're all going to have to lock down, or, you know. Um, I, I also found myself handling it with incredible poise and aplomb. Um, and I think the, uh, and, and so I, I tweeted that. I said, is anybody else who's got an anxiety disorder finding themselves handling this very well? And I got more than a thousand replies straight away saying, you know, yes, it's extraordinary. This is the calmest I've felt in, in my life. Um, which is so interesting. Right? I, I, and I put it down to, a couple of people said maybe it's because now everybody feels what we've been feeling like all of this time. So your, your, your tribe has finally come. It's yeah, like, well, some people like... Moment. Some people were like, you know, oh, you know, we just always felt so alone being anxious and now everybody's anxious. But that's not, that's not why I think, you know, it happened. I, I think it's because, you know, we, we spend our lives catastrophizing, so we're constantly pre-planning for catastrophic eventualities. So, yes, yeah, like this is what we've been training for all of this time. And yeah. the Daily Beast did a piece where, about the same thing, where they said it is a kind of phenomenon amongst anxiety sufferers. Certainly not all anxiety sufferers, but, but a chunk of us. But it's also one of the paradoxes, isn't it, about anxiety disorders that, um, you know, pandemics, no problem. You, you know, people who mm -hmm. suffer from anxiety, it's all in a day's work. 
but worrying yeah. about the, the shopping or you know the, it, it's it's the minutiae and the minuscule that tend to uh, agonize anxiety sufferers i think it's well i'm i'm a sort of i catastrophize um so for instance if i can't get my wife on the phone i, I just immediately assume that she's dead there was a, there was a time when um when my son was about seven or eight and I went to pick him up from school and the door was locked and there was nobody about. So my mind immediately went to terrorist gas attack. No, um, naturally. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I went through the whole kind of, you know, grieving process. And, yes. and um, But then as soon as, as soon, it's funny, I said this to somebody the other day and she was very like, oh, like, 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 uh, you know, almost a little condescending, like, oh, like, treating me like a kind of, you know, patient. And I was like, it's completely normal. Because <laughs> I sort of didn't want, <laughs> but, but obviously it's not completely normal. But it's, it's reaped rewards now because I, I made sure that we had enough hand sanitizer and toilet paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's I, I, think the, I, think that, I think this coronavirus is, is amplifying people's dominant character traits. Right. Uh, so, so authoritarians are taking the opportunity to be much more authoritarian, um, impulsive, irresponsible people are, are, are doing much more of that. So for instance, when I was calmly focused and planning for this eventuality, uh, Boris Johnson was making a big show of shaking hands with coronavirus patients, yeah. uh, which is a whole different way of a, of a brain working. Which is, but it's interesting, isn't it, that um, people who suffer from anxiety in their daily lives, when something really genuinely globally mm. catastrophic happens, are, are, are paradoxically the best suited to deal with it. I was reading um, a, a really good book called My, called My Age of Anxiety, and he quotes, um, he quotes a woman, a, a war reporter, saying, I feel calmer in war zones. I feel more calm when I'm being shelled. It's one of the few times I don't feel anxiety. Um, and I sort of feel the same when I'm with Nazis or, you know, there's a, there's a pandemic. Um, no anxiety at all. Nazis in a pandemic, which is... <laughs> 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 it's the, the next phase. <laughs> <pandemic. Yeah. laughs> But it's interesting, and then all these sort of, you know, and then people who, who have a sort of Stasi type mentality that they report people, even if they're social distancing, um, are having a field day too. Well, that's an interesting um, uh, thing that, 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 that leads us into a, an area that you've really made your, your own and, and people uh, come to you for sort of ideas about it because it's such a a global phenomenon in the age of social media, which is uh, public shaming. And you wrote, you wrote a brilliant book about this. Um, can you talk a little bit about, first of all, about the, the, the history of your interest in public shaming uh, and also why it is that it seems to be having a particular role in, in this pandemic, to your mind? Yeah, I mean, why I got interested, you know, as, as a, when I was younger, as a younger journalist, you know, I was a little... Um, Sort of judgmental, I suppose. And as younger people are, when they haven't gone through life's, you know, traumas, um, when they haven't got all the baggage of, you know, of, of bad things happening. Um, but as I as I got older, I realised that being judgmental was not something that a journalist should do, except for when it's really deserved. What a journalist should try and be is 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 patient and compassionate you know, empathetic, curious. And then I saw this wonderful thing, Twitter, which was wonderful at the time, I'm talking about, you know, 2010, 2011, uh, turn into a place where people behaved in the opposite way to, you know, what I spent my life realizing is the way that we should treat our fellow humans. So instead of being curious, people were sort of lurching to instant judgment. Uh, and instead of being empathetic, people were, demonizing other people and it just it's like you know you you know it's like I've spent 30 years trying to figure out the best ways to treat our fellow flawed humans and suddenly this new culture is coming along which is the opposite of that and, it, and it, you know it just felt, it felt very disconcerting to me so that's why I wanted to write a book where the least I could do I wanted to I wanted to make so you didn't publicly shame like the Blair Witch Project I, you know I wanted people to really feel the agony of, of, of what it is to be at the end of a of a pylon 
what it really feels like. Um, uh, so that's why I wrote that book. I wanted, I wanted people to feel anxious and sort of upset reading the book. Um, and yeah, I've noticed a real renaissance of it. And what's so interesting, I think, about this renaissance of shaming that's happening now is that it's following the same arc uh, as it did in about 2012. So in 2012, um, I remember the first, one of the first great shamings in about 2011, 2012, was LA Fitness, the gym company, refused to cancel the membership of a heavily pregnant woman who couldn't afford it. So she went on Twitter. And on Twitter, we created this sort of halcyon world, this kind of utopia. And we thought, you know, that's where everybody could be unselfconscious and everybody was being kind and empathetic to each other. And suddenly this gym, LA Fitness, wasn't being compassionate. So we should get them. So we got them. And LA Fitness immediately backtracked and um, um, the woman was allowed to cancel her membership. And it was incredible. We had a new weapon that, that hadn't really existed since the 1840s, the power to publicly shame. Yeah. Um, but then what happened was I think we fell in love with our new power so much, we got kind of drunk with it, that our standards really slipped about who deserved shaming. So it was no longer companies that had behaved unfairly or public figures who had committed actual transgressions. It was private individuals who made a joke that came out badly. And it was because we got kind of addicted to it, like a day without a shaming felt like a day treading water or picking fingernails. And it feels like the same thing has happened uh, in the last couple of weeks. So the first coronavirus shamings were, you could argue, you know, appropriate. Like there was a guy in Tennessee who bought, who went around Tennessee buying up 17,000 bottles of hand sanitizer and then gave an interview to the New York Times. Uh, and as a result of the ire, he donated the bottles of hand sanitizer to the, to the needy of Tennessee. Um, but then, um, well, in fact, can I, I so I, um, there's a woman called Jennifer Jacquet who's a pro-shaming academic. And I just read an article <laughs> in medium where it starts with these examples of, of you could say righteous shaming it's like you know that it's an unusual field isn't it yeah there's a couple of people there's a guy at Yale who who does it too and of course you know I, I mean shaming is a very powerful weapon so if yeah. it's used judiciously it, it can it, I suppose it can do good but it's impossible to use it judiciously so so this woman Jennifer Jacquet I, don't, I just want to read you this this line because it's like it starts off with these kind of good examples of you know, arguably righteous shamings. But then by the third paragraph, it's like a frenzy. It's like, we can, now we can like shame them. And she writes, um, let, me, let me just, I, I, it just made me smile. Uh, she wrote, um, um, shaming will continue to focus on prevention, but extend also into the treatment of the coronavirus as more and more people get sick. We will see more shaming related to the hospital conditions for both patients and personnel, especially related to the lack of beds, ventilators and personal protective equipment. Shaming will not be as easy in these cases as it is with social distancing where the rules and their defiance are obvious. It's like, oh my god, she's creating like, like the most terrifying um, weapon ever, like one of those guns that just fires all over the place. She, she has great warmth. Um, but, well, the uh, thing that, that I, I, you know, the, the problem with her argument, of course, is that, you know, when you take a righteous shaming and then use it as an excuse yeah. to shame everybody for everything, um, I, I, and also completely ignore all the myriad downsides, like the fact that Twitter is the world's worst information swapping service and is constantly getting <laughs> Uh, plus, you know, there's no context. You know, when somebody is shamed on social media, it's, it's without any context, at least in sentencing hearings, in actual, uh, in actual courts. But there's to, a lot of, to, there's to a lot of discuss the courts. Oh, go on, anyway, sorry, yeah. Well, to, to your point, I mean, about the, 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 the pandemic kind of accentuating people's dominant characteristics, has there been an uptick in kindness on Twitter as well? Well, as yes, so, so, People who, who have reached a place in their life when they realise that, you know, kindness and consideration and helpfulness is, is, is a really important uh, um, way to live your life are behaving kinder and more compassionately. I mean, just look at, you know, look at the health workers. Um, so it, it is, it's, it's kind of like this crisis is telling us who we are. So, so who, who we really are. And then you've got all of these doofuses who started... Uh, these, you know, like Alex Jones yesterday was shaking everybody's hand at a 
at a fire Fauci rally in Texas. Um, so, um, so yeah. Well, if we have time, we might discuss Alex Jones a bit because you have, uh, you have it's, it's, three. Yeah, it is really interesting that Alex Jones's new thing is to refuse to social distance as a way of triggering the libs. So yeah. he's thinking, look, look at all these liberals like outraged with me for like, you know, shaking hands with everybody in a crowd. It's like, <laughs> I just, it's a, it's a, I, I just wonder what's going to happen in a new form of text. Um, yeah. We've got, I think, Jane Walker uh, ready to uh, speak to you. Can we go to Jane? Um, is Jane there? There she is. Hi, Jane. Can you? Um... I'm on music there now. We, we can oh, hear yeah. Welcome, Jane. Okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> I've just got a message on the screen. I can't get rid of it. So, um, can you, um, you've got my question there, haven't you? I haven't. No, can you, can you, uh, can you let everyone know what, what, it, what it is, Jane? Roughly. Um. Um, no, I can't, no. <laughs> just, just get, move on to someone else. Sorry. No, no, you, was it not to do with the, the the permission to be lazy? Is that not correct? Oh yes, yes, that was. That's all I needed as a trigger because lots of thoughts were coming out from all yeah. these words. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, I've well. always told people um, that I'm lazy, and no one's ever believed me because I've done lots of things, travel and set up businesses and all. But I am lazy. Um, and so I found it very refreshing to be able to be lazy without beating myself up. Mm. So I suppose the question is just throwing out that have lots of people found that they're enjoying being lazy and that reduces anxiety rather than having to fight being lazy. Yes, I think that's true. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an introvert, so I'm loving the fact that not having to go to parties and not having to shake people's hands is, is no longer considered slightly odd, but is now considered sort of heroic. And, and <laughs> um, personally speaking, I'm, um, I've got this sort of weird thing where, all, where my self-esteem is wrapped up in my work. So it's like I can't be lazy like I, I would love to be more lazy exactly I, yes I'm guilty yeah but uh, but no I think so my first thought when this happened was people are going to have to be productive I mean people are going to go nuts if they're not being productive but actually I was talking about myself <laughs> if, if, if you know if being lazy is making you happy then then you know be lazy <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's an opportunity <laughs> yeah totally um I mean at the same time, I feel a little sad. I was thinking about my son. You know, I'm upstate, but my son's in Brooklyn, which is, you know, Plague Central. And for me, it's, this is fine. I mean, this introverted, staying at home lifestyle suits me wonderfully. But I, I do feel really sorry for, I was just thinking last night, I feel very sorry for people of my son's age. He's 20, and he would love to be out partying. And, you know, it's, it's easy. When, 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 the, when the lockdown is working for you, as it is for me, I think it's very easy to forget that it's not working for lots of other people. Yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. It's just um, think... everybody's talking about how they're anxious and it's not working. And you almost need feel bad about saying, well, actually, I'm enjoying it. Um, yes. But of so... course, you're thinking about all the horrors of it and all the mm. traumatic. Uh, we all think, oh, we've lost our lives. But actually, it's a, a black statement because some people actually are losing their lives. So... Yes. Um, yes, it's a, a double-edged paradoxical statement, isn't it? Yeah, I, I find so myself right. I find myself checking myself because I'm finding this so easy because it's fitting into my lifestyle, and I find myself, you know, remembering that. We're, we're, Jane, thank, thank you very much. Could could we come to Emily Lacaze? I, I think if I pronounced your name correctly, Emily. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. I'll stop my video. Oh, please. Hello. Out of curiosity, how is this working? Like, so for the people watching this, can, so they can see, Hi, Emily. They can see Hi. it, right? You had a um, point about FOMO, I think. I, yes, I've found that in the past few years, I've been feeling um, exceptionally anxious about getting old and missing out on the dreams of my future. Um, <laughs> and now we've gone into lockdown, I just don't have FOMO anymore at all. There's simply nothing to miss out on. Nothing's happening, and that's great. I'm the calmest I've felt for years. Yeah. How do you 
what, I mean, obviously the, the huge question is like how much of this stuff is, is going to change the world. So are there going to be people out there who realise that leading a sort of smaller life away from the rat race suits them and they're going to carry on doing that? Or are they power elites who are the ones who sort of, you know, force us through their tactics into being part of the rat race? Are they going to take over again once this is all over and we find ourselves having to do things that we don't want to do for economic reasons? John, you, you, you dealt in the, them with um, the, the book them about, you know, the whole idea of a, a, the secret room, as people call it, you know, the idea that there was a group of people in conspiracy theories who were running the world. And I just wonder how you think, I mean, it's a very, very archetypal conspiracy theory model. It's, it's survived for centuries in anti-Semitism. We've seen its latest manifestation in the 5G technology. Mm. Uh, I think 5G seems to be a combination of two dominant conspiracy theories. A really interesting thing about conspiracy theories is that it's a template and people, people who would sort of, you know, whose minds work in that way just shove whatever event is happening into their pre-existing template. And with this one, it's two things. It's like the power elites, are uh, you know secretly controlling us and, and, and also the whole 5g thing so, you know we're being poisoned by 5g which is another you know which is just a, a cousin of the conspiracy theory that people are putting fluoride in the water to keep our brains uh, mushy uh, so it's always it's, yeah. it's always like it's so often the same conspiracy theory just with, in different words recycled yeah yes do you think um I mean, when you, it's difficult, of course, it's speculative, but when you look at the world beyond the lockdown, uh, do you think that, that, that whole sort of percept, that paranoid perception will change, uh, worsen, improve, or just be the same? I, honestly, I think, that, I think the, the, the jury is still out. We still don't know. It's, I mean, I'm fascinated to see what will happen. Um, because for me, um, you know, a lesson that a lot of people are learning from this are, A, you don't need to lead as, just like Emily just said, you don't need to lead as, lead as stressful a life as you thought you did. And B, you know, the common good, you know, we've all been living in the age of the self for decades and suddenly you could say this is the age of the common good of people helping each other like, like, like life was in, uh, I guess in the 1950s, or certainly the romantic idea of the common good, which obviously- Yeah, sure. Um, so will those things be lasting or not? Or more likely, you know, will the impulsive, more psychopath, less thoughtful and more psychopathic people who tend to rise to the top because they're so ambitious and dominant or dominating, will they manage to win and life will just go back to normal? What, Miranda? Uh, hi. Hi. Hi, John. I'm, I'm finding this whole experience really interesting because it's completely put on its head the whole um notion i had of myself mm -hmm. I'd, I'd really identified myself as being somebody who couldn't sit still always had to be doing something um sort of sitting down was equivalent to being really lazy out about and doing things and then suddenly i'm forced into this new way of life and I'm loving it. <laughs> so what are you doing? What small things are you doing that you wouldn't normally do? Um, sitting, watching the birds, watching the sky, uh -huh. um, just listening to the radio, thinking, literally just being. Yeah. A small... Um, the small things, really noticing things that I would never have noticed before. Yeah. I've been planting lots of grass seeds. We've got a garden up here. I've been planting a lot of grass seeds. I'm going to be slightly bereft when there's no empty patches left because I'm not totally sure I know what to do then. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm interested um, in some of your thoughts because it's got me thinking, what is it that I want to keep from this experience? What do I want to let go of my old life? And what, what do I want? Yeah, and what do I want to bring of my old life along with me? So those sorts of things that when we have to go into this <laughs> reintegration, what is it I want to learn? So for you, what are the things that you would want to keep from this experience? The thing I find a little bit 
sad is that everybody's saying, you know, oh, when this is over, I'm going to have the biggest party ever. When this is over, I'm going to be like this with my friends. And then they post a photograph of lots of little birds all cuddling each other. And I'm thinking, when this is over, I, I want my life to stay exactly as it is now. I don't, I don't want anything to change at all, which is actually quite, quite sad. And, and, and I mean, this comes from a place of like kind of massive introversion. I should, I should tell you my introversion credentials, which is that in 2012, I went to the TED conference in California and a fellow speaker was uh, Susan Cain, who wrote the, the great book about introversion called Quiet. And she's like, you know, she's like the sort of, you know, mother of introverts. And when she gave her speech on stage, uh, the head of TED came up afterwards and got everybody to give her an extra round of applause because she's so introverted, but still she managed to get up on stage and talk to a thousand people. And I was sitting there sort of glowering because when I was backstage talking to Susan Cain, I was so introverted that I literally destroyed my name tag lanyard. I was like fiddling with introversion so much, whereas Susan Cain's lanyard remained like absolutely intact. So anyway, my point is I'm more introverted than the woman who um, wrote the book about introversion. So for me, you know, this is, I just want to, to, I just want to, I want to stay in this little village. I, I want to, I would love to, I would love to not get on planes anymore. I'd love to find a way of writing that keeps me at home instead of takes me all over the world. Um, I certainly don't want to worry about, you know, uh, um, making money to buy things. That, that just causes stress. Um, so yeah, I, I want everything to become, to become smaller. Um, and, I, and I wonder, I, I do wonder whether like, if lots of people feel that way, if lots of people think, you know what, you know, fuck, fuck the rat race. We've been, we've been, um, there was a really interesting tweet the other day, which was if the, if the, if the economy is really suffering because people want to stay home, well, people have to stay home and lead smaller lives, maybe that shows there's something wrong with the economy. Um, and part of me feels that, you know, maybe we've all been sort of tricked into what to lead, into leading these kind of, you know, high stress lives, especially if somebody else is making the money out of us. The very first ever video call I ever had with anyone um, was with uh, Robbie Williams. And that, that was terrifying. Imagine your very first Skype experience with Robbie Williams pops up. I never felt quite so um, self-conscious in my life. <laughs> Robbie Williams staring at me from my laptop screen. Well, can we come to uh, Charlie Rogers in, uh, while we're trying to help Catherine? Charlie, are you there? I am, hi. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm just getting my video set up. Um, so I just wanted to ask John um, about um, the whole going back to normal and the introversion thing, because I too am a massive introvert and felt almost guilty about how happy I am that I now have a socially acceptable reason not to go outside. Um, and I'm a little bit, I mean, I'm really lucky. I'm so lucky I'm able to work from home. Um, so I've been I've been doing that. So I've maintained my income. So I've sort of I've got this weird balance between wanting to realise how how privileged I am to be in my position when there are so many people who've lost their jobs, but also a bit anxious about when if or when the world does go back to normal and I I have to go back outside. Do you feel the same? Yeah, I, I wonder whether. It's funny, introversion, a little bit like a bad memory, is, is, un, is unfairly, sometimes also the way people look, it's like there, it's unfair ways to judge people. Like, I've got a really bad, certainly being an introvert, you know, people are still sniffy, you know, or, or take it personally if you don't want to go to a party or shake their hand. Um, and people take it personally if you can't remember their name, when, when the reason why you can't is because you've got a bad memory. Um, so I wonder whether maybe in the same way that um, people know what it's like to feel anxiety now, if they're not usual anxiety sufferers, maybe as introverts, um, and I've noticed somebody saying, what about the ambiverts? Um, so I, I sort of half mean you as well. Um, maybe uh, people will understand more now and it'll be okay to, I mean, my dream world, you know, I've hated um, everything that Trump has ever said. 
Um, he's only said that, but last week Trump said the very first thing that I, that I ever agreed with, which was um, maybe in the future people won't shake hands anymore. And I thought, you know, finally the president is offering a vision of a, of a world that I can buy into. Uh, so maybe, um, maybe one positive thing that will come from this is that people will understand more. They'll understand anxiety more, they'll understand introversion more. Um, yeah. Maybe. I mean, it's interesting, John, isn't it? Because a lot of people who have anxiety uh, paradoxically seek out jobs which involve huge performance tasks. And, um, you know, I've seen you often enough uh, in that sort of context to suspect that you don't really suffer badly from nerves when you're on stage or talking to a big audience. You never... It's weird, it's, it's strange. I'm fine on stage. Um, I'm fine hanging out with Nazis. Someone asked Louis Theroux once, like, why, why, you know, why does he hang out with, why does he put himself in these kind of dangerous positions? And I think Louis' answer was the same as mine, which was uh, not doing it feels worse. Uh, what's really anxiety inducing is, is a narrative that you will never, you'll never be able to tell because you were too scared to sneak into the yeah. group or hung up with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, I think for a lot of anxiety sufferers, it's, it's what's known as what-if worries. Um, a, a lot of what-if worries, if, if they start with the words what-if, that's a way that you know that they're irrational. Not real, yeah. yeah. I can't get my wife on the phone, what if she's, she's dead and so on. So it's, so it's weird, I, I can quite happily like, stroll on stage in front of you know, a thousand people um, you, or, or do something dangerous for a story. But I fall apart, you know, if, I, if it's two o'clock in the morning and I can't get my son on the phone, um, I, you know, I, my, my mind immediately goes to the worst case scenario and I'm, I, I can't function. Um, can we so come to Elaine Chong, I think, who had a, a question. Elaine, are you there? Can I add one thing? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Something I said, which is, I think, I think with a lot of anxiety sufferers, it's to do with being capable. Um, yeah. Because with this catastrophe, with this pandemic, the reason why I felt so calm was because I felt capable. It's like, okay, I've catastrophized my whole life and I can, I can handle this. Yeah. Whereas, and I can handle going on stage, I can handle interviewing Nazis, but if I can't get my phone on the phone, I'm, I'm incapable, like, what would I do? You, you, know the soft, you know the software of catastrophes, you know, you're familiar with it. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. I'll tell you one mistake though, I downloaded an app that tells you like every bad thing that happens in New York. Because I thought if I can't get my son on the phone, at least I can go on this app to see if anybody who matches his description has died. Uh, and, it, and so now I know of every bad thing that ever happens in New York. And I'll tell you what happens in New York a lot more than you think. Scaffolding falling on people. Anyway. It's probably a suboptimal download that. Um, Elaine, sorry, thank you for waiting. Thanks, Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Hi. Um, this is going a little bit back to um, public shaming. So earlier when you were telling the story about LA Fitness, um, it reminded me of the comedian Joe Lycett. Um, he's got a telly show on Channel 4 taking on big corporations. So recently he changed his name to Hugo Boss just to give them a headache because Hugo Boss has been coming down hard on small businesses that had boss in their name. Right. And I was wondering, because there is a difference between what he does, which is pulling pranks you know, on big corporations. And somehow that is tantamount to public shaming, but is it less bad because they can handle it? Well, it's, it's really interesting that when, when I wrote my public shaming book, I, I, I had to, because there hadn't really been, a, there wasn't really a debate going on about public shaming as I, as I was writing the book. So I had to, I had to think, well, what am I, what am I against? Um, you know, what are the parameters of what I'm against? And I thought, well, I'm not against satire. I'm not against journalism. It sounds like what Joe Lice is doing is, is satire. I'm, I'm not against criticism. Um, I'm not against citizen journalism. Um, so what am I against? And, and I, and I realised that what I was against was the disproportionate punishment of usually private individuals who really haven't done very much wrong. <laughs> So, so that's sort of my, my, my sphere in, in the public shaming thing. There's other people, I think like Brene Brown, who are pretty much against all sorts, like sh shaming, like all shaming is bad. But I think that sounds like too much of an idea, like a sort of extreme ideological 
position. So I sort of, so yeah, so my answer is I, I, I think uh, sort of, you know, you can't, you can't have a world where there's no satire. So yeah, so I, I wouldn't include Joe Lysett in my, uh, in my uh, litany of bad shameless, my little list that I have on my wall. I think Simon Hyde had a, an interesting question about journalism, if Simon's there. Hi, Simon. yes I am. Hi Simon, how are you? Uh, I, I, I actually teach students journalism for a living um, and a lot of them are, well they're all under lockdown now and they have projects to do and they're finding it very hard, or two things, one is to kind of conceptualise journalism that is not about um, the current crisis but also just the kind of logistics of doing it. I wondered how you managed to kind of go about the business of journalism when you're stuck in one room and also does being an introvert help with that because you've developed the ways of working that don't involve lots of um, engagement with other people the whole time? Actually, the, the, the second question, no, because I, I find talking to people on the phone more anxiety inducing than, than being in a room with them, annoyingly. Um, and the answer to the first question is I actually haven't done any journalism since the lockdown. I've, I've been, I'm very fortunately, I'm writing a, um, a story for a screenplay, so you write the story first, and then when they like it, you then write the screenplay. So luckily, I've been like like John Goodman in Barton Fink. I've been living the life of mind um, for the last month, but I'm dreading um, I'm dreading handing it in because once I hand it in, I will have to start thinking about another book, and and um, you know I'm not 100 percent sure what that's going to be yet, and and then you you will have to be confronted with that problem, like how can you do journalism, particularly the kind of adventurous writing that I do, if you can't leave your house. Um, you know I'm not a polemicist. This is this is these are these are fine times for polemicists who can just like Piers Morgan, who can just like sit there and pontificate. Um, but my type of journalism is going off with no preconceptions you know, leaping into a world, having adventures, and then trying to figure out the world from being within it. And yeah, God knows how that's going to happen when we're all in lockdown. John, can we just ask you, uh, you mentioned your screenwriting, um, just on, on pass on really, um, that you, you, you uh, co-wrote a rather brilliant Netflix movie called Ocho, which was, came out, I think, in three years ago, uh, mm. with none other than Bong Joon-ho, who, of course, is now you know, uh, has, has ascended to the stratosphere, uh, uh, thanks to the Oscars. Now, what, t t tell us about him and what it was like to work with him and... Uh, well, I've realised, because the other, because I also wrote Frank for Lenny Abramson, who's next yeah. one won an Oscar room. So I think my legacy is that I write <laughs> the film, his next film goes on. The Oscar Whisperer. <laughs> yeah. Um, Bong, Bong was great, you know, he was, he was, he was lovely and kind and brilliant, um, which is, I, you know, quite rare in the movie world that <laughs> somebody is like extremely nice. But um, with Okja, Bong, Bong wrote uh, the first version, the first verse of the first draft of the screenplay, and then basically asked me to do whatever I wanted. He sort of gave it to me and said, do whatever you want. You should probably focus more on the uh, English speaking characters. So I then wrote, you know, most of, um, Tilda Swinton's character and the Animal Liberation Front, Paul Dano and so on, um, and Jake Gyllenhaal's character and the Korean scenes. I, I did a little bit of stuff with the Korean scenes, but, but almost but very little. Uh, so that, that was the division of labour. Um, but really, I, you know, I, I really feel about Bong. He's such an auteur that if you like, you know, it's, it's all him. Like, you know, yeah. if you, um, if you like Oakshire, that's because of Bong. If you don't like it, it's because of Bong. If you like Parasite, that's because of Bong. You know, it's, yeah, that's that's uh, that's very yeah. self-deprecating. It's, it's a great movie, and it's really yeah, I recommend it to anyone anyone who hasn't seen it. On it, it is on Netflix. It is wonderful. Yeah. Um, can we go to <laughs> your uh, Shannon? Sorry, John. Yeah. Talk about how a tourist Bong is. I, I watched him when I was on set for Oakshire. Um, I watched him walk up to Lily Collins, who played one of the um, members of the ALF. And, you know, in her scene, she just had to point at somebody. And he walked up to her and he, and he took her arm and he moved it a fraction higher. Like, you know, you're literally, even the way that people stand is... is it's part of the craft. It's, it's all gone. Yeah. Amazing. Um, could we come to Diora uh, 
Shadi Hanover, please. Uh, Diora, are you there? Hi. Hi. Hello. You? Can you hear me? Welcome yeah. to Something. Great. Um, hi, John. So I'm uh, also a journalist. And when I first started in my career, I did a lot of, I think, public shaming. And even though I thought it was a good thing, because I thought, oh, I'm doing journalism. And even though what these people did was really bad, I thought that um, the trial by media thing was a good thing. And then I think I kind of grew up. And now looking back on it, I'm like, oh, unsure. Because I read your book and I was like, oh, maybe, you know, the, it's quite disproportionate, the hate that they're now getting um, versus the thing that they did. And it got me thinking, do you think that the want to shame is a lack of emotional maturity? Because I also think about the people who, you know, mess up. And a lot of the time, they're just emotionally immature and they grow up and they realize they've made mistakes. But actually on the inverse of that, sometimes the people who want to shame so much might also lack that maturity. I, I, I completely agree. I think in, probably, you know, not in every case, but I think in a lot of cases, that's absolutely true. In, in a similar way, uh, you know, when I was writing the psychopath test, I thought, God, children are so much more psychopathic than adults. You know, they've got so much less empathy and they're, they're so they're much more impulsive i mean these are all items on the psychopath checklist you know they um they've got a lack of realistic long-term goals they're they're irresponsible so i said really excitedly to a psychiatrist um do you think children are more psychopathic than adults and like we grow out of our psychopathy and i got such a cold look like no that's not true at all that i never i never went <laughs> But I actually think that maybe there is some truth in this. And I think it's very similar to, to what you just said. You know, when we accumulate, you know, when you're young, you're immortal and you think you're better than everybody and you're remaking the world, um, which is what people should do. You know, a generation should come along and remake the world. That's, that's how society works. But, but unfortunately, what, you, what a lot of young people haven't accumulated is, you know, pain, <laughs> baggage, um, problems, um, and it's those things that make us more empathetic, wouldn't, wouldn't you say? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm kind of intelligence. I mean, you know, the big story for my, for my public shaming book was the famous, you know, Justine Sacco story of, you know, the AIDS tweet woman. You know, she, she just, she's about to get on a plane and she tweets, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. Um, now, I think the reason why I didn't see that joke, I mean, I saw it as a very poor joke, but the reason why I didn't see it as a horrific joke was because, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Randy Newman, and I understand the sort of humour of self-reflexive mocking of your own privilege. But that's quite a complicated idea, right? On the, that something that you say isn't meant to be taken exactly the way that you said it. You're maybe you're doing an exaggerated version of yourself to mock your own privilege and and so on. And I think a lot of young people just didn't get that because it's quite a sort of nuanced and complicated idea. Not helped by the fact that she did it very badly. It's a very bad example of it. Um, so yes, I, I think so. I think. I think I'm less judgmental now than I used to be for exactly the reason that, that you just said. But I should say, you know, journalism should also be holding the powerful to account. It's, you know, it's okay for journalism to sort of expose malfeasance. I mean, we, we should be doing it. I think the key word is, what you, is the word that you use, which is proportion. It's, it's all about proportion. John, you've, you've relished irony, I think as much as any writer I know. You know, your, your writing is shot through with a very humane sense of irony. Do you worry that irony is um, diminishing a little on the altar of literalism a bit? Yes, I, I very much do worry about that. I, I, you know, when you, all the people who I admire are people who take complicated thoughts and reduce them to the smallest number of words. Um, Kurt Vonnegut, Randy Newman, um, Tobias Wolf, Raymond Carver. I mean, that's my very favourite type of, and, and irony is a big part of that. Irony is saying something, uh, uh, but you know what the person really means from reading between the lines. Yes. And because Twitter tends to reward 
a lack of context a lot of the time. We don't need to wait until Justine Sacco's play lands. We know what she's like, you know, is what people were thinking while she was on the plane being, being destroyed for that bad tweet. Um, and in fact, if somebody said, can you not wait until the plane lands so we can hear, the co you know, we can hear what she meant, that was considered weakness. So consequently, um, yeah, my, I do worry that my sort of writing, um, which, which isn't, well, I don't make a big point of saying this is exactly what I mean. Like yeah. I think of writing as a partnership between the writer and the reader. Um, I, you know, I, I say enough for them to then figure it out. But yeah, that's more dangerous than it used to be. So there was a line that I cut out. I don't know if I really want to go down this road because it's a long and painful story. But there's a line that I cut out of, so you've been publicly shamed, which I felt fitted within that. It was a line where I knew what I meant, but it didn't spell it out. And then somebody got hold of a galley of the book and tweeted a photograph of that particular line. And then everybody sort of went crazy at me um, until I explained. And then everybody on Twitter said, you know, I'm sorry, John. Um, we were wrong to be angry with you. I, I can't imagine a life without <laughs> irony. Um, theme of what Twitter would be as opposed to what actually happens. Exactly, an irony for you. What them. actually happens on Twitter is when, when people realise that they that they got that they got the wrong person. Yeah. Uh, is they just don't say anything about it and then you just go on and shame somebody else instead. Yes. Very little self-reflection. Very little. Um, Ed Gillespie's there, I think. Ed, are you with us? Oh, hello there, yes. Hi, Ed. Hey. Welcome. Far away. Um, I, um, I didn't think I actually listened, asked the question, but I can make a comment. <laughs> well, even better. Even better. No, no, I, I mean, I, I just think I'm really struck by the point that John was making about the fact that, you know, if the economy is broken by us leading simpler lives, then maybe we should rethink the economy. And I think this, this opens up huge cans of worms in terms of, you know, what we prioritise, how we regulate, how do we voluntarily... Uh, kind of uh, sacrifice some of the, the kind of luxuries and privileges perhaps we've been enjoying uh, for a long time. And I, I'm, I'm just really curious about what your feelings are, John, about how you inspire perhaps that, that sense of voluntary simplicity, that what really matters is not a lot of the guff that we've been um, swallowing for a very long time. We're about to be gaslit in a way that perhaps we've never been before in the kind of aftermath of the crisis. Is everyone going to tell us that? Buying all this stuff will make you feel great again, people. Um, and I'm sort of terrified by that. I, I, I've worked in sustainability and environmentalism for 20 years, and this feels like an incredible moment of potential pause for a radical reset. Um, and I'd just really welcome your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I, part of me wonders whether this, you know, should be my next book, because I'm very, <laughs> I'm very curious to know how you know, our uh, evil elitist leaders will find ways to put the world back to the way it was, which was to their advantage and not necessarily to ours. I'm sure they're going to try. <laughs> so the question is, you know, will they succeed? If they do succeed, what tricks will they have pulled on us to succeed? Um, so I'm in the same place as, as you, um, and I'm really curious about it, but I, and I really want to keep watching. I really want to see how they try and do it. Um, this is probably a little bit boring, but my, my wife is, is my wife's an art consultant. She goes into people's houses and tells them what art they should buy. And she said that a gallery owner um, wrote an essay uh, in an art magazine a couple of weeks ago, where he said, "You know what? This you know this pandemic is showing me that you know the unethical things that we do we shouldn't do anymore. Like like you know." Um, orchestrating paintings to sell for millions by sort of, you know, getting people to bid up against each other and so on and all this stuff's really bad and we shouldn't do it anymore. But then my wife said, but how, how are these art galleries going to survive if they don't start making money again? So maybe his great intention of trying to create a fairer art market is going to fail just by the nature that the gallery has to survive and so they have to start, you know, making big money again. So, so like you, I'm really curious about this. I think I, I actually think this is the big story of, our, of this of this moment in, in history. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, I'm sure lots of people have already written when you go back when you look back on the Black Death. I mean, the aftermath of the Black Death, 
was definitely a better world. Um, serfs got to move into, you know, landowners' homes. Serfs could no, no serfs had power because so many people died. The serfs were like, you know, okay, we want more money, we want a better house. So the aftermath of the Black Death undoubtedly created a more egalitarian society. Um, will this one, uh, like you, I, I, I strongly hope so. Um, so what tricks will be played on us to prevent that from happening? Does it give you pause for thought, uh, John, that, I mean, it seems to me that one of the rules of the game is that Amazon always wins. Mm. And I, I noticed that Amazon was uh, recording sales of $11,000 a second during this lockdown, yeah. which suggests that our consumerism has not totally diminished, shall we say. Although I think most people are just buying, I mean, yeah. certainly from my own experience, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm buying essentials. For me. Yeah. Um, it's, it's mystifying to me, both in terms of how people's personalities work, but also in terms of just practicalities like PR why Amazon are still, treat, you know, treating their workers badly, not giving sick, I mean, the last I read was that they weren't giving sick pay and so on, when they're making such a huge amount of money. I, I, I said to my wife the other day, isn't this short-sighted? Like, you know, I know Amazon has all the power, but surely they're, they're, they're thinking that, you know, the more Machiavellian and you know, like, you know, like sort of, you know, evil billionaires they behave, the more people will want to shop elsewhere. Um, it's like they're, I think they're, they're banking on us needing them more than we want them. I think they'll move into public policy next. I mean, they're already down to, no, they're already down to deliver the, um, the testing kits in the UK. So, yeah, yeah. no, I, yeah, absolutely. I know I, one of the very first people to phone the White House um, when all of this started was, was Jeff Bezos. Was Jeff Bezos. Um, we have uh, Joe Tapper, I think, waiting to ask a question about. The role of the media, Joe. Are you are you there? I am. Yeah. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, Joe. Hello. Far away. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah. About the media, I was just wondering. It, it's quite obvious to see or guess how the media are going to respond. I was wondering how you think the media should be responding, both during and after this crisis that's going on. Well, um, I mean, maybe I'm just a mod sap moderates but but over here in america i think cnn have been really have been really good i mean um as far as i as much as i know basing everything on facts and evidence and being you know being pretty fair being pretty balanced and so on um so yeah science i mean in terms of the media i think um i think that the science and reason it seems to be you know, anyone who can think this through knows what we should be doing, right? I mean, as hard as this is for, for people's livelihoods and so on, if everybody goes back to work, of course there's going to be another wave, uh, more people are going to die, and the economy will flounder again. So it's, it's kind of really obvious to me that we have to keep social distancing. Um, it's obvious. As, as hard and painful as it is and and uh, I know that's a bad answer to your question but reason the, the media should be uh, should be using reason do you think we do you think we'll see um, a sort of long kind of interlude John where the, you know where, where we're just kind of figure trying to figure these things out yeah I mean it's Although, not something that comes if, easily is it well I think if we sit and wait for things to get figured out too much then you know, we'll just find ourselves back in the back in the same bad world that we were before all of this. Yeah. Um, so there has to be a bit of agency and will and collaboration. I think so. Yes, I think so. I think if people really want this, if the majority of people really want a more egalitarian society to come out of this, then we should be actively trying to think of ways to do something about it. And is that something that, you know, do you see this as a kind of punctuation mark in your career, accidental or otherwise? Yeah. I, and actually, completely selfishly, it's come at a pretty good time for me because I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to, to do <laughs> next. <laughs> this, this, um, 
this pause. Every story I do always feels like the last story I could possibly do. Uh, like I've, I've put everything I have, like my whole life, all of my thoughts into this. So every book or, or podcast or whatever becomes like, I then have to sort of reset my life. You know, with the psychopath test, I thought, okay, well, I've given that book everything I know. And then it took me four years to write, so you'd be publicly shamed. Um, and again, I thought, okay, I've put everything I know into this. And then similarly with my podcast, The Last Days of August, I thought, okay, I've got nowhere to go after this. It's almost as if every book is me forcing myself into a corner where I've got nowhere to go. So after the last days of August, I thought, okay, I've got nowhere to go. So actually, personally speaking, this has come at a pretty good time because I didn't know where I was going. And we're, we're, we're running out of time, sadly, but one thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, you, you made a name for yourself by going and writing about things, often, you know, with considerable physical danger that were rather crudely characterized as weird and odd and fringe. And I think one of the things that the internet age has done is it's kind of melted that division between the weird and the normal. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that, that, that it, it must be interesting finding all the things that you've written about in your life and your career now kind of completely at the center of mainstream culture. I know, I know. Of all the people I wrote about in all of those years, if you'd said to me like, okay, one of these people that you've written about in the last 35 years is going to have the ear of the president. Who should it be? I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have said Alex Jones. Alex Jones, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's startling to me that this, these um, irrationality, conspiratorial thinking, psychopathic character traits, all of these things I wrote about for years, all now... You know, mainstream commentary or, or like power like how power works. yeah how power moderates yeah and john we, we could go on all evening uh sadly zoom is very strict in its uh timing so we're we're up we're up against the hour uh but thank you so much for giving us your time it's been a pure delight thank you i hope people enjoyed it i know it was all a bit sort of just no, absolutely fascinating so i hope people will wave to john and please come and join us at um, Thinkings in the future. There are plenty, plenty, plenty more. Go on the app. Well, um, come and come and come and come and join us again, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Well,